Echo Hawk. My name is Desiree. I am a true spirit living in occupied Arapaho territory here in Colorado. Yeah, welcome everybody to First Foods. It's always a pleasure to have everyone back. I'm really excited for tonight's class. I am a Taino mother living in Matinecock territory, New York. And I am here, you know, just to be your semi kind of host or whatever and go over protocols and such throughout today and um, some disclaimers that we're gonna have in a little bit. So Desiree, if we could go to the section. So yeah, so some of our protocols is land acknowledgement, native knowledge, intertribal space, foraging and harvest, food sovereignty, and of course our disclaimer. So land acknowledgement, we recognize, uphold, and respect native nations and their life ways above all else as the ruling governance of Turtle Island and Abiala. Everyone attending these programs should also have the same respect and um, more than a statement, have it be a life way for you. Native knowledge, so we have many different teachers from across Turtle Island and South America and also Indigenous Caribbean coming to these programs. And just so that we're aware that Native knowledge is not to be monetized by non-Natives or even by other tribal community members. The knowledge is generally kept between you know, traditional homes and communities and things like that. So we don't wanna be violating anybody's knowledge and how they gained it. And, and also it's a safety issue because sometimes it takes like you know, generations and, and decades to learn a skill or a trade. Intertribal space, so just everyone coming to this space who is from different nations, just please be aware that, you know, we might be discussing things that are uh, like, let's say food systems, for example, you might have different names for it or different uses. It doesn't mean that one is right or wrong or better than the other. Or one person's more Indian -er, or one nation is more Indian -er than the next. Let's try to avoid that and make this a really um, positive space for intertribal connection. Foraging and harvesting, always seek permission from tribal communities to forage and harvest these medicines or foods. Um, maybe it's seasonal or they're probably replenishing. So you just don't want to touch anything, especially if you don't know the plant. And also respect indigenous communities if the medicine keepers and, and the nations that are traditionally from those territories say no. Food sovereignty, first people have the rights uh, to hunt, fish, forage, harvest, grow food systems, participate in food systems and how they see fit, uh, determine nutritional content and value for themselves, and participate in either contemporary or traditional dietary styles. And this is just really important for a non-Native community because many times there's judgment passed on Indigenous foodways, and Indigenous foodways have a relationship with the land that a lot of non-natives don't understand. So it's it's just best to kind of, when you come to this space, realize that you're a guest and just sit back and, and just watch and, and participate in a respectful manner. And then lastly, our disclaimer, I believe. Yep, for some reason it is not coming up. So give me one second to pull it up. We have our disclaimer. So just remember this first foods is for educational purposes and gathering purposes. So before using ingesting any herb or plant for medicinal or even culinary purposes, just consult your physician, medical herbalist or still professional. And if you're from traditional tribal communities, always go to your elders and your medicine keepers and make sure that you are receiving proper information so that you don't harm yourself. Lots of herbal plants uh, or medicinal plants can, you know, conflict with medicines that you might be taking that are, you know, prescribed by the doctor. So you just want to be aware of those things and, and make sure that you're following protocol in that regard. Okay, well, thank you for the protocols, Brooke. Welcome everyone to First Foods, a program led by and made for Indigenous people and our allies who are ready for a new day for old ways. We'd like to thank our partner, Ibex Puppetry, for the ongoing support as we build this program that makes critical knowledge available from the culture bearers that hold the oldest knowledge on the continent. 
something so many of us need at this time. So today we have instructor Deb Echohawk, who is the keeper of seeds for the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma Seed Preservation Program. They believe that the seeds have sustained their Pawnee for hundreds of years and should be part of the daily diet. Deb works with her brothers, Walter, Lance, and Roger, as well as the Nasharo Council of Chiefs, Cultural Committee, and PSPP team. The project is unique as they have 18 volunteer gardeners from their tribal homelands in Nebraska and Kansas growing out their seeds in addition to Oklahoma gardeners. It is an ongoing story of their challenge to bring back their non-hybrid corn for the welfare of the people and it is very promising. So welcome Deb, thank you so much for joining us and I will hand it off to you. Thank you so much. I wanna thank everyone for putting this wonderful program together, giving us an, a platform to share our knowledge and I uh, uh, especially want to thank Heather as an ongoing uh, support system. She's really been a great encourager. And uh, honestly, uh, there's just so much that she has given us. It's just uh, more than you can, than I can even begin uh, to say. So uh, with that, I would love to uh, tell you what I want to talk about tonight. I am the keeper of the seeds for the Pawnee uh, Seed Preservation Project. So I, I would like to tell you uh, about how it began and our hopes for tomorrow. We would also um, like to uh, tell you how we start our gardens, uh, the nurturing, the mulching, transplanting, checking on the health of the plants, and uh, so hopefully you'll get a knowledge of our Pawnee traditional co crop culture. And I would also hope to uh, show you a little bit about our seed storage. Um, for that, I'll have to log in again using my cell phone. So Desiree, help me out at that point. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay, let me see. I just lost my notes. Um, it took two days Would to- Would you like me to pull up your PowerPoint? The, sure, the first page would be nice. Okay. Okay. In the beginning, the Pawnees descended from the white star, sun, and moon sky origins. The first woman was wrapped in corn husk and contained the seeds of life within her. And the first man was wrapped in a buffalo robe. And when discarded, a herd of buffalo sprang forth, thus establishing our first homeland. And life was good. The Pawnees prospered over the years, met many people of all nationalities. Early in the 18th century, more than 60,000 members of the Pawnee tribe had permanent earth lodge settlements on the prairie lands of the Nebraska Territory area along the North Platte River. The tribe then, as it is now, was composed of four distinct bands, the Chawe, Kitkahaki, Kitaharata, and the Skidi. The Pawnee Prairie ancestors hunted buffalo, small game, and fished the rivers and streams. Our ancestors developed a special relationship with plants that allowed their cultivation for food and medicine. And this gave a central element to our culture and our survival. All bands grew crops and gardens, harvested wild plants, and that provided for much of our traditional diet and resulted 
in our ability to feed ourselves with healthy foods that is culturally and spiritually significant. These practices embodied in working the land and water and caring for seeds that provided the basis for the Pawnee, Pawnee's respectful connection to the earth and with each other. The Pawnee Band's ability to grow food is a culmination of countless generations of sowing and harvesting seeds, and those seeds are the continuation of a broken line, unbroken line, well, at times broken, from our ancestors to us and to our children and grandchildren. The Pawnees classified as a friendly tribe by the US government. And in these slides, there, you'll see some men are in uniform. They're part of the Pawnee Scouts. And uh, there's a nice Earth Lodge Village image uh, in the corner. Um, the Earth Lodge was a lot meant a lot to us. And it once inside, it actually embodied two things. One is it noted our sky perspective um, in, in how the stars were a part of our everyday lives. And it also, um, symbolize the, the womb of the woman. And it was the Earth Lodge then that was part of the woman's, let's say, ownership. Settlers in Nebraska who lived near the Pawnee learned from one another and enjoyed a special relationship whereby the stories had been passed down and recounted as a testimony of heartfelt friendship. The Pawnees embraced America's freedoms and have had served in, in all military conflicts and to date, beginning with the Pawnee Scouts of the U.S. Army to aid the ongoing conflicts between colonists and the Native Americans, and also served during the Indian Wars and the protection of the United Pacific Railroad construction in Nebraska between 1865 to 1877. Not a single life was lost on the construction of the railroad. After further advancement by white settlers and encroachment of other tribes, not friendly to the Pawnee, the Pawnee ceded their territory to the US government in the 1800s and were removed from Nebraska to what is now around Pawnee, Oklahoma in 1875. Many perished along the trail. The Pawnees brought their seeds with them and protected it. Later, the number of tribal members was a little over 600 in the 1910 census count. So that was a sad time. At first, the Pawnee found Oklahoma to be welcoming, having found Sun, sand plums growing by the river, like how they grew in Nebraska. Things were different. Even the sound of thunder, the soil was different and the seeds didn't grow well in the hard clay. Seeds and crops were grown and studied around 1900 by George Well and George Hyde noting unique traits of the corn and all the known varieties were noted. Youth in Oklahoma attended Indian boarding school named the 
Pawnee Industrial School, affectionately known as Gravy U. Established just east of the present city of Pawnee. Here the youth learned the mainstream studies and did not grow their heritage seeds. The schools were closed in 1958 and the land was returned to the Pawnee Nation in 1968. Many of the former industrial school buildings now serve as the tribal offices and as a home for the Pawnee Nation College. Today, the Pawnee are living in the mainstream America and enjoying the, joining the traditions of the tribe. The number of tribal enrolled members is over 3,500. The Pawnees can be found in all areas of the United States as well as foreign countries. Pawnees take much pride in their ancestral heritage especially in what we have started in the Pawnee Seed Preservation Project, where we have rekindled our homeland friendship ties and honor our ancestors practice with Father Buffalo and Mother Corn. Many years, the seeds were stored. Uh, let's see if we could back up. Uh, stored away back to the elder um, with families and not grown out. In 1990, Pawnee siblings, which is Roger, Walter, and myself living in Colorado, decided to grow out a variety that Diana Henry retrieved from a museum in Kansas. It was the eagle corn of the Kikahaki Pawnee. Not long afterwards, I moved to Pawnee, Oklahoma in 1997, and it became important to see how many of the varieties were still in existence. After all, we were known as the people of the father buffalo and the mother corn. Cousin Nanny and I asked around and gathered three varieties. So in 1998, Elder Nora Pratt bless the varieties, and that's an image drawn of Nora. With an hour long prayer where she reminisced about Nebraska and how wonderful the corn had tasted. She talked about how she longed for that time and how she longed for just to be able to eat it again. And so that's what she prayed over with those seeds that she held in her hand was that someday we'll eat them again. So that prayer alone is what inspired the formation of the Pawnee Seed Preservation Project. Thanks to the Culture Committee and the Nasharo Council of Chiefs asking tribal members to turn in seeds to which I accepted the role of the keeper of the seeds, our seed bank began. It had taken many years to get our varieties back. At times, they waited several years to open up old sacred bundles to find only about 20 seeds of one variety of corn. That's one of our sacred bundles. Chance would have it, Mrs. O'Brien wrote a commitment statement after a, a lengthy phone call to me. Um, and she wrote, I had been a gardener in central Nebraska all my life and am prepared to apply all my knowledge of our soil, insects, weather, and other intruders to help bring back the crops of the Pawnee through horticultural cycle. I am incredibly excited to be involved with the project that could bring back two Nebraska crops that were grown here in the 1800s by the Pawnee. The culture committee 
debated about having a charistaka grow our corn, but agreed that growing in the homeland might be best. So they took a chance on Ronnie O'Brien. Some corn seeds couldn't germinate. And at times we only had less than 20 seeds per variety. The corn was virtually on the brink of extinction. Had to include this really sexy picture of corn. The eagle corn was strong. That's what's pictured here. And, they, and it did well, very well. So in 2003, I began working with Nebraska Homeland Ties with Ronnie O'Brien and her master gardener friends. And I see Pat Hoagland is here. She's one of our, our gardeners that's been with us over 15 years, right, Pat? Yeah, it's been a long time, but I'm Okay, next. Through the rematriation efforts, our corn has returned to the Pawnee. Roland White of the Indigenous Sea Keepers Network explained the meaning of rematriation in this way. We have been using the word rematriation in this seed work as the act of bringing the seeds home from places they have been outside our communities. It is this form of repatriation, but from my understanding a Mohawk woman, our seeds and food fall within the realm of our women for safekeeping. So we've been using the word repatriation for such homecomings for our sacred seeds. We have new hope for old crops. We are also noting that our corn that was analyzed by Will and Hyde in the early 1900s have the same characteristics as it does today. The corn of the Pawnee have not changed in over a hundred years. Thanks to the growers of Nebraska and the Oklahoma Pawnee the corn thrives and it is important for our communities, tribal feasts and special meals. And hopefully in the near future, we will combat our daily poor diet by making our corn part of our substance again. The corn now helps the Pawnee Akiharu in many activities honor dances, Native American church meetings, hand games and sporting events. The Pawnee Indian Veterans hope, hosts a uh, Memorial Day dance, veterans dance, and a Christmas dance that's free and public to the, free and open to the public. We host a two week encampment for our sister tribe, the Wichita. And many of our folk camp out during this time. We always ask the birds and the animals who live at the campground permission to use the camp for a short while. And when we leave, it's cleaned up nice for the animals and the birds to return to how it was before we borrowed the space. The Pawnee Seed Project works to foster a new generation of seed growers by learning and using tribal heritage seeds and planting techniques that introduce tribal members to Pawnee agricultural traditions while teaching the community the value of growing and consuming local healthy food. Someday we'll all be enjoying the Pawnee corn. Who knows, we may send it to space, to Mars, when a mission becomes possible. In the meanwhile, 
thanks to maintaining homeland ties, we now have 17 varieties of corn and crops in the seed bank. How the Pawnee Seed Pro Preservation Project works with starting gardens, nurturing gardens through mulching, transplanting and checking on the health of the plants. We have a lot to think about as we thought how best to do our gardens. When I started with our corn, my brothers described how our ancestor made, ancestors made mounds. It pays off to have brothers who are tribal historians and researchers. So I have always used mounds or hills and tried to amend them for addressing climate change and soil needs issues. Our 18 gardens in Nebraska differ in how they start their gardens. Pawnee Seed Preservation Project soil expert farmer in Nebraska, Dale Fike, owner of Fike Cattle Co Company. And it's really well um, worth it to go to his, um, his, um, Face, uh, no, his uh, email site, which is uh, fike, F I C K E, cattle.com. He can help with soil needs. He does cover cropping and has his cattle work the soil so it doesn't need tilling. He has a great newsletter that's worthwhile to read about water conservation, soil conservation, and insight into other farmers' frame of mind. Most of our 16 new and local gardeners are tribal members and use the mound method. The mound method or hills are shaped in an even number. In our reference, it's to represent the women's breasts. Okay, so double A size is for typical Nebraska soil. <laughs> the hills vary from two foot to one foot tall. Nebraska has sandy loam soil, which is 60% sand, 10% clay and 30% silt particles. It has a poor ability to hold water, so it needs to be uh, frequent watering to, for it to thrive. In Oklahoma, we describe our mounds as double D size. The hills sizes can be larger from three foot wide to one and a half foot tall. The red, red clay that we have um, has oxidation effect on iron. So it's an iron rich soil, just like you would picture a corroded water pipe that turns all rusty color. That's, that's what's happened with our, our soil. It forms a crust after the rain and then the water runs off. So hence, Shaping it into a bowl with mulch mix in the middle is what works and doesn't need watering after the plants are well established. Okay, so then we go to a double E size. <laughs> For our, our new Oklahoma community garden, well, that's just what we do. Okay, so let's back up to the map. And here, I, I just wanna say that uh, you, you really should know what type of soil you have so that you can plan appropriately. Soil testing is important, especially if you're composting. Your local county extension office can usually test for a modest fee. I found out that the acidity level was high. So 
I no longer add lemon or orange peel to the compost pile. Can we cue the, um, the, the uh, video tour? Sure thing, give me just one second. Share screen. Here we go. Oops, I need to actually hook it up to the audio. One second here. Audio. All right. Hello, this is Deb. I just wanted to show you something that I love. It's uh, my compost pile. I have it inside a fenced yard. And um, I have all kinds of things coming up. But what I love is all the gifts that the compost heat gives me. There's a bunch of plants growing up. I always call them my mystery plants. I'll probably transplant a lot of these to see what comes out of them. Some sort of melon, I imagine, or squash. Um, actually, there's some seeds attached to one of those, so I'll have to examine that. Um, we've had uh, some success in um, getting things that were from my kitchen into the compost heap, and then they wanted to grow. So we have transplanted um, many plants over the years and I want to show you for example um, when I cut off the tops of pineapple and put it in the compost heap um, the pineapple plants started to grow so here's two two pineapples that decided to grow. They're two years old, and I'm hoping this year maybe they'll produce some pineapple. Um, and then over here, I really love my little avocado tree. Uh, you know, it's a little bit crooked at the base, um, but again, here's another compost heat tree that decided to grow, so I'm just going to go with it. I encourage everyone to use their kitchen scraps, add it with uh, leaves that fall. And when you start turning over your compost seep occasionally, you can um, see how it's just decomposing really nice. And uh, this planter box here is all harvested, every bit of it, from the compost heap. Um, so I have a lot of potatoes growing in it right now. But because of the, the leaf mixture in there, it should be real easy to go in and pull them out. Um, but again, use your kitchen scraps for composting. It's just a shame to throw them away because our earth always, always does better when it's replenished and you can do your part too by that. Take care. Okay, so you notice the mounds. We have put mulch in the middle of that. Uh, if it wasn't for this mulch, it would have a big crust over it and uh, the water wouldn't penetrate the soil very, very well. 
If you're using a cover crop method, that's beautiful. It's the best way to conserve water. Um, bragging rights for having healthy soil is to have eight to 10 inches of water saturation in one hour. Our farmer, Dale, who's part of our project, lives in Nebraska, can brag on 30 inches of water saturation in one hour, which is nearly unheard of. And it has brought dry climate agriculture people from around the world to his farm to learn just what, how he does that. Farmer Dale is keen on growing barley, alfalfa, Shoshone, same flown, and turnips to build his soil. He also uses hairy vetch. The cover crop seed mix is a great way to attract pollinators, and they also provide diverse nutrition to the soil crops and livestock. If you take time to watch uh, this video um, on YouTube, um, there's a 50-minute um, video that you can share with your tribal leaders. There it is, you can write it down. Um, for enhancing your agriculture department team. And believe me, you will not regret it. Farmer Dale is awesome. He's got a great sense of humor. He believes that it should be a federal regulation not to have lawns, just gardens. Our new gardeners, new gardens are always adventure as our clay soil has about two inches of water saturation in an hour. So we till as best we can. Uh, this machinery costs over $70,000 and it really had a time scraping the soil. It was, uh, it was as if it was just hard pan so the whole time from top to, and I, I think he only got like four inches till, uh, tilled up that day, which is kind of sad. Uh, so we are thankful for our Nebraska friends because as uh, Ronnie O'Brien explained once, uh, she, she said, Nebraska is like one big sand hill. Um, so that's our homeland. Okay, so to start a new garden, you can till it as best you can or just use a hole, which is all I ever do. Determining the size and shape of your garden, at least one eighth acre is ideal for strengthening a variety. However, with a hundred seeds or more, these tips, uh, here's a few tips to help strengthen the variety. Prepare to plant in a field circle or square shaped pattern and have a four foot wide path prepared for sunflowers plants. The square works best. Pollination and genetics are the best when they're planted that way. After we have our seed blessing in April, our team goes into seed distribution mode and sends Pawnee seeds to tribal members and to those who have their garden plots ready. The first thing is to plant the sunflowers. That's what you're, you see pictured here. The sunflowers protect the corn from rain, disease, and animals. Um, if you remember on the sunflower stalk, it's real spiky and so like rabbits, they don't like to get their tender little noses through that. Uh, so it does work as a great fence. We refer to the sunflower as our fourth sister 
to a three sister garden. Okay, so it does provide a wind block. However, in the case of 65 mile, mile an hour winds that just happened a few days ago, just park next to your garden. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm gonna show you a few other slides here. Uh, this one was up in Nebraska with our Pawnees that, that uh, went up there on internships. Um, just hold, hold the hills where you need them. Okay, uh, well, okay, so what I'm showing in these pictures are all the sunflowers and how uh, important it was to put it up there. Nebraska happens to be one of the windiest states it seems, Pat, shake your head. Does it, 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 there's a lot of breeze all the time, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll, we'll get into how we do our hill method. Um, okay, so just hold the hills where you need them and start filling them into a plateau look. It's rough until it rains. Plant corn in well-drained soil, the hills work great. Do not treat the soil with any chemicals at any time. Do not fertilize seeds, soil when planting. It's not necessary and can be harmful to the, plant, the seeds. There's different ways to germinate your seeds. Oh, okay. Um, you can start them in rag dolls, which is what is pictured here with beans. If uh, desired to plant seedlings and or select for best germination. Seeds can be floated in water just before planting. Eliminate any that float to the top. Soak your seeds in nine parts water, one part 70% isopropyl alcohol for one minute to reduce smut problems from preventing from the previous crop. Plant all the seeds at the same time so that they will all pollinate at the same time for maximum genetics. Planting seeds too close to each other reduces the yield of the ears. So each plant should be produce one to five ears. One or two is most common. Planting seeds too close to each other increases the livelihood of smut and or aphids. Water well after planting or plant just before it rains. After uh, the rain, the rims can be made from the clay soil. Hoga culture techniques. Um, if you're familiar with hoga culture, that's a, a German word and it's uh, H U G E L K U L T U R. It's a great word to Google. But this technique is great for drought prone locations. In the bottom of the hole, Plate, what we do in, in uh, uh, places that we cannot water that much, we use the hogoculture technique and we dig out the center and we place corn cobs at the very bottom. And then you add about a fourth of the way up with soil and then add some shredded cobs in as well. So with the hogoculture technique, they suggest, the Germans suggest to use 
rotting wood at the bottom. It acts as a sponge and then it does a slow release of moisture so you don't have to water. Okay, next slide. Keep the soil moist during germination. It's good to let the top of the soil dry out each day. Watering by hand well to keep from overwatering and to water evenly daily. Um, this is Mikai, and she's our, our cultural consultant uh, that works with this. And Honestly, one ingredient that she adds to all this is that she sings to the to the, all the seeds and to the plants. And she's just beautiful about meditating and praying with them too, which is always nice. The seeds will germinate. They'll pop up through the ground in five to 18 days. The strongest seeds will germinate first we document the number of days from planting to germination and do not hoe until you think all the seeds have been germ germinated. It will look weedy. Seedy, seedlings and young plants are susceptible to high winds and may need extra protection depending on the garden site. Plant with heels uh, with corn and beans together. Water in the middle is all you need to do at night. In the daytime, in the hot Oklahoma sun and the heat, the shade of the beans shade the ground, help keep the corn up during mild winds. And another thing that those two plants do is the corn takes nitrogen out of the soil and the beans add it back in. So it's a great relationship. You can, however, begin fertilizing once a week, um, especially after the second leaf has, has uh, come up for the corn and you can look and check on the, the health of the corn by the what, what it's doing with the, um, what color it is, and you'll uh, definitely know whether or not to fertilize. This is um, one bag of this coop poop. It's really uh, wonderful. Uh, you can use it once a week. Uh, the way you would make uses is to uh, grab a five, gallon bucket and a hand handful or maybe two handfuls of the coot poot, put it in a bucket, fill it up with water and um, let it set for a little bit and you just go out and water your heels. Uh, and that's as soon as all the plants have, have uh, germinated. Okay, before you know it, the corn will be shoulder high. <laughs> the corn can be walked through because of the spacing between the hills and soaker hoses can replace watering by hand. The plants do not have to be watered every day once they start to have tillers. Document, document, document. That's one thing that we have done. Uh, you see Kahita out in the garden and over in the shade is, is, is all her clipboard and, and she's out doing her measurements. The plant growth data characteristics need to be collected and compiled. Hashtag seed security. It's, it's really amazing in this day that even though we have been as natives um, 
cultivating our corn for hundreds of years that we need to protect our corn and find a way to patent it. Um, you know, it's just ridiculous to think about, but that's what we're doing. Um, and Kahita has been with us for uh, three years as an intern. Um, now she's going to UNL on a full scholarship. And uh, in her graduate work, the first thing she'll be doing is um, the DNA work and the nutritional tests, which will be all part of our procedure in showing the world that we have ownership of this corn. And we are glad that our data matches the will and hide documentation, as well as uh, one other person uh, that did work earlier than will and hide. And um, that was James R. Murray. Uh, but that's another story. Okay, so what I've showed, shown you here now is a little bit about our Pawnee corn. Pawnee corn has a lot of pollen to go around. So guess which plant is Pawnee corn and guess which one is modern corn? Okay, the one on the left is the Pawnee corn. I bet you all knew that. Okay, so now let's go to the next slide. This is showing us the silks of Pawnee corn and modern corn. And again, the Pawnee corn on the left is uh, what is being shown here versus the modern corn. And I say modern when really we know that it's been uh, manipulated quite a bit. Um, so Pawnee corn silks are plenty long to collect and catch the pollen. Okay, so the next, um, we'll show the corn in a milky stage. And uh, corn smells wonderful in the milk stage. It can be eaten or dried. This stage also has problems. The eagle corn on the right is in the milk stage. The raccoons and deer love the small, strong smell of corn in the milk stage. So you can imagine what happens. Okay. Um, smut pictured on the left and aphids love wet Pawnee corn ears, tassels, and stalks. You have to check for earworms at the top of the ears daily at first to assess if there'll be an issue with each garden. Earworms are the worst. They begin to appear in the milk stage and are most prevalent during the dough stage when the kernels are no longer milky, but doughy. Like other insects, neem oil can help to control the number of ears, worms in the ears. Spray the silks in the cool evenings once or twice a week during this, that time and uh, that the silks appear and do not wash it off. Water only in the evenings, so the plants will get a good drink and have all night to recover from the heat of the last day. Water at ground level to be more effective. We drink through our mouths. Plants drink through their roots. The corn pollinates best in the morning when under 80 degrees. I would water at night to encourage production pollen production overnight, then help the corn pollinate in the morning before it gets hot. 
if you water in the morning, I doubt the corn will be able to produce pollen before it gets too hot. I've helped plants produce pollen during extreme heat and still produce seeds by running a very slow drip soaker hose during the day to keep the roots cool. I shut the water off when it's cool down at night to help the water, help the corn pollinate the next morning and it helps. Okay, so. This is um, showing you just how ancient our corn is um, when it when actual kernels appear in the tassels. Um, that's kind of a trait that you would note when you realize that that corn is is so ancient and you know it after all it did start from a grass and went through a teosinte process uh, before it became um, corn that we recognize and teosinte is 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 a, a a time when the corn was was um, grown like this up in the tassels and 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 then started to form uh, cobs and they it, it's very 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 hard um, in fact um, as it evolved uh, one of the uh, friends that we have in Oaxaca, Mexico, um, science person said that uh, he believed that the hardness that came out of the kernels then um, is what has produced the cobs that we have today um, and the corn going around that. So, all right, so we know that then as the corn matures, then we get into the harvest stage. Uh, the corn can be harvested as soon as the inner husk turn dry, but we also, uh, but will have to be hung or dried or with the fan immediately or it will mold uh, within a few days and it will need to be hung for about two weeks. Um, and, uh, recommend bringing it in from the elements as soon as possible. Um, if corn is if left out in the field too long and we get another rain, it actually starts sprouting again. It just loves to grow. Uh, corn can be left in the garden till completely dry. It's wise to dry it at least a few days after bringing it in to be sure that you have all the nice corn silks. And with corn silks, I gotta say, Pat uh, has really helped us out on, on uh, utilizing corn silks in her diet. Um, it has helped a lot with uh, uh, people that have dialysis problems. And, um, Pat. <laughs> Han wrote uh, a note for me about corn silks um, that it's used for the many medicinal uh, conditions. And the list is very, very lengthy. Um, you know, it, it, it inflammatory uh, membranes, minor pains, um, uh, corn silk will can dilate the blood vessels. So it's a treatment for high blood pressure, works as a diuretic, um, it helps those that have kidney or bladder stones problems. Um, and it can help treat a urinary tract infection, uh, congestive heart failure, hypoglycemia, high blood pressure, um, blood clotting, gout, arthritis pain. Um, it helps with those that have diabetes. So we 
at the elders' request at the our tribe's um, meal program. We've been serving that now since uh, uh, it was brought to our attention. Uh, so that's been about three years that the elders had all their tea and uh, juices infused with the uh, corn silks. And uh, so we, we'd like to think that they're they're better for it. Uh, um, all right, so we we try to uh, hang up our corn. Um, and that's a fun process. And here we have it hung in our ceremonial house in the rafters. And most of everything that's hung is um, seeds. So it's way up high and it gets to enjoy the sounds of the drum and, and the dance, everything. Uh, it, it's nice to have it among our culture. Um, so with that, um, I'd just like to conclude this part um, with uh, saying that the merging of our cultural preservation and economic development supports our cultural survival. Um, now, I'm not too sure if Electa is on at this time. But if so, Desiree, um, I'd like her to go ahead and, and, and begin to talk um, what role she has. Because, I mean, I've been at this a long time, but the uh, um, real nice point of what I'm doing is it would be meaningless for me just to, to keep working as to what I'm doing. Um, without passing it on. And, and so Electa is the assistant for the seed culture or seed project. And I'm not sure if she's on, if she's on or not. It doesn't look like it. No, okay, yeah, she had a, a, a day. Uh, so she warned me that she may not be able to get on. Um, but, um, well, uh, I would still need to pause and uh, maybe everybody else could appreciate a little break while I uh, log out and then log back in with my phone, Desiree. Okay. okay. We can, uh, we'll hang in there for just a minute. Uh, at this time, I am going to make it so that folks can unmute yourself if you have any questions. So as Deb is working on her phone, We'll take questions. I did receive one question on email, um, which was, is it too late to plant pumpkins? <laughs> Everybody's asking that. <laughs> um, I think it's really fun. Uh, it, you, can, you can ask that question in um, uh, Google because what you should look for is a map of your area where you live and um, um, they should be able to the, I don't know, Farmer's Almanac and some other things, they'll, they'll indicate where you live and if it's still good in good timing. Uh, for us, us down here in Oklahoma, um, I just encourage everybody to get it, get it in by the end of June. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have questions? Well, can I, it's not really a question, but um, I've visited all of this, this project, I just, I just, is like an, an endorsement, an announcement. I just think that the project is so special. Um, it's really amazing to see this corn um, coming back to, back back to this bounty that it is. And I, I love that picture of the corn hanging um, from the rafters, um, from the pop beans. It's, it's extraordinary. So this is just like an, an, I don't know, testimonial to say, I think that this is really um, amazing work that's that's happening. And I think um, that 
that um, Deb and the whole community has really, it, it's really special. I, I can't tell you how, how inspiring this whole story is. So um, I'm just really grateful that she's here talking to everybody. Sorry, this isn't a question. This is just me talking. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Does anyone else have any positive uh, sentiments to share or questions? I think otherwise, um, it looks like Heather, thank you so much for sharing the links that you have been and also on the Facebook live feed in the group, the first word food group, I saw that you were also posting some links. So thank you for doing that. Any other comments from anyone else? Otherwise, we can wrap up class for the day. Well, I there are questions, but I don't want to disturb Deb while she's trying to switch her things. I mean, I did have like I don't. What is it? Anyone know what a rag doll is for putting your seeds in a rag doll? Is that something that other people have done? Because I've never done it. I don't. I don't want to take if Deb is working on switching her video feed. I can't, I can't even find the link. You do it in paper towels and get them damp and put the seed in the paper towels. Oh. In paper, and why, okay. So do those need to be kept in the dark? I know sometimes you put seeds like in the dark for a couple of days while they soak and then put the paper towels in after a few days, like in the sunlight? I don't know, Pat, is that a question you might could help answer? I think they have to be kept in the dark. Deb would know more on that than me. Mine have all just been planted right in the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I germinate the seeds um, between two paper towels and, until they just barely sprout. And um, um, I don't have it in complete darkness. You know, it, it just, I, I figure that, um, you know, the, between two paper towels it will is suffice and you could have it just in a room. Um, but I wouldn't put it out in sunlight directly, direct sunlight but it, it sprouts real good just between wet paper towels. How many of you guys on the chat have uh, planted corn? Okay, we got one, Pat, okay. Who else? Nobody, no, no corn? Cheryl, Cheryl, hi, Cheryl. Hey, what type of corns do you guys plant? Um, I was given the corn, so I just plant what was given to me. I didn't ask where they got it or what kind it was, but since it was a gift, I, I just planted it how they told me to plant it and it grew. I was really, really lucky actually that it grew, but I, uh, I, I treated it like, uh, because it was a gift, I, I, um, I asked it to, to grow, um, um, and, and feed me. I, I asked it to because I didn't know. I, I mean, I talked to it like I talked to my babies, like, can you behave? Can you grow up strong? Can you listen to me? Uh, can you grow? Um, and and I, I used the no-till method. Um, and we were given um, sets of sets of directions. And it was a, literally a, a, a gardening class where we learned how to do no-till gardening. So I did have help along the way with the instructor and with other people. But uh, yeah, I lucked out and it grew everything but my sweet potatoes because we had uh, something growing under the ground, eating my sweet potatoes under the ground. But my corn turned out perfect. It turned out really good, I was surprised. What did you cook with it? I dried it and I just saved it for winter. And when we made soup, then I just made soup. Beautiful, yeah. I love that. Yeah, well, there wasn't very much. It was just like I only had one row, let's say three rows, but not, not very long because it was like my first no-till garden. So, um, but I got a lot of squash. Uh, the squash ran over 
the whole the whole my whole backyard just went crazy. Yeah. But, uh, Sounds like a good problem to have. So I'm really interested because I don't know how to save seeds, but I know I should be saving them. Mm -hmm. uh, Deb, I see that you are going on your your phone. Did you want to show us some things on Show and Tell? Um, Deb? Yes. Would you be able to speak quickly on seeds saving and storage? Because Cheryl was interested in, in learning how to do that a little better. I'm not sure that we can hear you, Dad. Are you there? Yes, I'm there trying to. Are. We okay. got you. Um, after you get the seeds off the uh, the cob, um, we we go through all all the seeds. Uh, like I said, we we pick pick the the undesirables first, and um, before we run it through a sheller. Um, and then we, we run it through a screen to filter out any other uh, undesirables. Uh, there, there may be some that, you know, have holes in it. And uh, so that's usually an indication that someone's uh, making a little home in there. So we take all of that out. It's really important because um, in storing your seeds, if you have any weevil in there at all, uh, they like to make little apartments in this corn and they will uh, play havoc on, on your corn and eat it without any air um, whatsoever um, and, you know, stored. So um, I'm gonna show you where we've, we've moved quite a bit of the corn here. Um, and believe it or not, we're still working on 2019 corn um, to get it to the, the mill. And, you know, thanks to COVID times, we're a little bit behind on our schedule. Um, it's always nice to keep some of this, you know, keep your glass containers. Um, I'm going to show you where we're storing the seats now. Um, these are wonderful containers to get. You can order them online. Um, make sure that when you order anything uh, plastic-like that it's a uh, BPA free, and that will uh, then be safe for your food, and uh, it won't emit any uh, toxicity. Um, these are nice, beautiful containers because they have sealed lids on them that clip down. And so I would definitely look for those. Um, but now this shelf unit, this is in my basement. And uh, because I live uh, near fracking sites, we've had uh, issues with uh, earthquakes. And we've, we've had to put up steel beams here um, to address that. And we do run a dehumidifier and that, that gets emptied um, almost every other day. Um, so we can control the humidity here. So that's one thing I would, I would warn you about is if you're going to store in a basement, um, or a place that has a high humidity to monitor that and make sure that, um, that it is in control. Um, these are Mormon seeds. Um, one Mormon seed can produce several 
uh, squashes out of that. And those squashes are huge. They're, um, they, when we would cook them up for the elders, we only needed one to feed 80 people. <gasps> wow. And that's when you use one part um, squash and two parts <laughs> um, kind of beautiful brew broth. I mean, um, save your beautiful husk. Because the Native American church will be knocking on your door saying, let me have some of that, please. Um, I'm going to go upstairs real quick just to show you some a nice treasure that I have. Uh, so, welcome to my house. This is the living room. And uh, corn is everywhere. I mean, who has, uh, you, you've heard of uh, bean bags for furniture? Well, here's, here's some real bean bags um, filled with real beans. I'm sorry. Okay, here's the treasure I have. We keep it really cold in here. Um, but in the corner is two, in those two jars, in, in those two jars are actual corn that was brought down and uh, when we walked down from Nebraska. And in, in the bottom of one jar, that, that white part, uh, that uh, actually um, soil in Nebraska look very sandy. Um, so I have above my cabinets all kinds of other seeds up here. Um, I like to have it to where I can see the corn um, and and those containers, <clears throat> you know, they're see through. And again, it's it's nice to see through your containers so that you can always check the health of your seeds. Um, because, like I said, if there's any um, weevils, they will they will destroy a whole container. Um, so these are painted like a horse beans. Those are beautiful beans. Um, you cook them up like pinto beans, and the only magic behind these beans is they don't give you any gas, and they taste 10 times better than pinto beans, and our elders love it. They've had it for over three years now at the Elder Center uh, as part of their, their food. Um, and, you know, just to show you the variety, I, uh, we, I didn't say how many varieties we have. This one is striped. We, we uh, called it the knife chief corn until Dr. Hogemeyer in Lincoln, Nebraska was teaching a class and one of his students brought in um, a seed that was buried in a skull. Uh, well, it was in a buffalo skull that was buried uh, six feet on, in, in the sand and um, when they brought that buffalo skull to the surface, it rattled and it had this seed in it and it was striped. And we here we thought um, that the knife chief uh, family had, um, or Charles knife, knife chief had uh, done some cross pollinating and came up with a real strange variety because of all the stripes in it. Cause the rest of our seed pretty much is, is pretty uniform and and uh, strong, um, but but inside that skull and uh, that area hadn't seen buffalo since 1865 was that seed and it was viable. So what a blessing there. Um, and then I, here's more seed here. Um, one, that that's really the end of my uh, the seeds that we have, 
uh, keep them dry, keep them, um, you know, check on them all the time because um, you don't want anything bad to happen to them. Um, this is getting ready to go out to our community garden. It's our, our fourth sister. Um, and uh, um, that, um, the image I showed you of the walk through for the mulching, um, that was on May 18th. And we, we just had our windstorm. So I'm just gonna show you that, um, what a difference it's, it's been in just a few days. And I'm taking um, Del Fike's advice. Uh, I got rid of all the grass in my front yard and the lawnmower. And I'm just tilling to the hills now and enjoying the front yard a lot more than when it was just grass. Um, but that that's all I have for the presentation. Uh, you're so welcome to contact me anytime. And, um, uh, or, you know, we, we do have a beautiful team working with us. And uh, so we are uh, researchers at heart and we will be glad to uh, try to answer any questions you may have. So. All right. Well, thank you so much, Deb. That was incredibly informative. I had no idea there were so many varieties of corn until all of a sudden I'm looking at your many um, containers full of corn. I, yes. It's, it's I forgot truly to amazing what you've done. So thank you for yes. coming on. We, we, have seven, we have 16 varieties. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, we're, we're really blessed because they are all um, non-hybrid. So they haven't been cross pollinated with anything, and they're some of the varieties that we're getting back. We're we're getting a chance to taste it for the first time in over 150 years. So we're truly blessed that it that it tastes good. <laughs> Brooke, is there anything that you'd like to close us out with? Well, for tribes, um, um, I recommend that they keep looking for their own um, in, into their own past and, and seeing what they can do because you never know uh, what you can revive and definitely uh, this has been a real nice adventure and it's still going on so um, just encourage you to keep working with other networks there's a lot of people now that are interested in, in the seed sovereignty. And, and so I think um, that's one way that we can combat the bad diet uh, trends mm -hmm. that we are seeing today. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you for inviting me to do this. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to do this. Thank you again. And that'll conclude our class, our first food program for the day. We will see you next week. Thank you again to our partner, Ibex Puppetry, for the ongoing support to make this happen. Um, it's been incredibly moving for our community to continue to learn from these aunties and grandmas that are coming onto the first food program. So thank you. We will see you next week and have a good day. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.